I guess. But uh, okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and talk about Mary Little now. Right. This morning we have the great privilege of meeting Mary Livermore. After her death in 1905, she was described by one Boston newspaper as America's foremost woman. The New York Times had called her one of the four most popular speakers in America, and she was the only woman in that group. Yet in the century since her death, other figures from that era have eclipsed her in fame. So in just a moment, she'll be joining us up front here, and I'll be taking on the persona of a reporter, and we're going to talk to her about her life and experiences. Mary Livermore was born in Boston, 1820. She became a leader of many social movements of her era, including temperance, abolition, suffrage, uh, and Christian socialism. Though raised in a strict Calvinist home, she would choose universalism, eventually marrying a universalist minister. She was a prolific writer. From an early age, she published novels, poetry, and then newspaper articles. As an advocate for women, she not only supported suffrage, but also emphasized, in the class, uh, although, though educated in the classics herself, she emphasized the importance of vocational education for women as well. At the newspaper founded by her and her husband, she employed women typesetters. And she publicized the names of employers willing to give women jobs in non-traditional fields. ...today to tell us about her story. So now, uh, would you please join me in welcoming Miss Mary Livermore? Please. Well, let's start with uh, a little bit about your background, and let me get out my reporter's notebook, which looked very much like a script to me, but it's going to be my reporter's notebook. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about where you were born and uh, something of your family life as a child. Well, I, I have mixed feelings about my childhood. I, I was raised most of my life in Boston, which I enjoy very much. Uh, I know my parents love me very much. My father was a veteran of the War of 1812 and a laborer most of the rest of his life. He, he was not well educated, so he made certain that all of his children were. I owe him a great thanks for that. Uh, still, he, he could be very strict. I remember my childhood as eminently and severely religious. Ooh, tell me more about that. How so? Well, to develop my reading and my religion, uh, they had me reading the Bible all the way through every year, but they let me read other things too. Uh, one year they got me a beautiful red leather bound copy of Robinson Crusoe. Mm, very nice. But when they found me reading it on the Sabbath, they threw it into the fire. Oh. oh well, you must have been very angry when that happened. Determined was more like it. More than anything, I wanted to be on my own, responsible for my own life. Responsible for my own life. Thank you. Were you able to do so? Oh, yes, absolutely. And this is why I have such mixed feelings about my childhood. I owe it all to education, and uh, I owe all of that to my father's determination that I should have opportunities he never had. Well, tell me more about your schooling. Well, I had been well-educated first at the Hancock Grammar School and then at the Charlestown Female Seminary. But that's not what you think. Uh, boys went to seminary to become ministers, but for girls, a seminary was more like a private academy. They called it the Rib Factory. Rib Factory, what did that mean? Well, <laughs> the joke was that Charlestown was just a training school for the future wives of the boys' school down the road, you know, like Adam's Rib. Oh, uh -huh. there you go. I see. Go ahead. I studied French, Greek, Latin, Italian, and I was well qualified as a teacher. But I did not find work right away in Boston. The schools like Charlestown were very rare in the South, so it was common for plantation owners there to hire Charlestown graduates as personal teachers for their children. 
which is exactly what I did. I left my home at age 18 for a new life as a private tutor on a Virginia plantation. I never again lived in my family's home. My goodness, uh, 18, traveling all the way from Boston to Virginia. That must have been quite an adventure. Tell me more about that. Well, I must say, the, the whole experience changed and, and shaped my entire future. When I arrived, I, I knew little about slavery. My parents believed, raised me to believe it was wrong, but I, I had never thought about it. I returned to my New England home a pronounced abolitionist, accepting from no one any apology for slavery. Mm. What was it like working for slave owners? I only saw a slave beaten once, and that was by the overseer, not my employer. Still, even in its most benign form, I found it very disconcerting. When I arrived, I was assigned a servant, as the slaves were called. I, I tried to reject this, but the family insisted, and I backed down. On the first day of classes, each child appeared with a personal slave, carrying their books, knapsacks, dolls, and things. I tried to send them away, but the children were so attached to them. Uh, they insisted that they stay. In any case, I was treated well, and I regard the whole experience as quite positive in my life, but I was happy after three years to return to New England and find work teaching in schools there. Well, of course, I know you did not spend the rest of your life teaching in school, so how was it that you turned from your uh, teaching career to the path for which you're so well known now? Well, it was hardly a single turn, <laughs> but a series of turns. It started on Christmas night in 1844. I, I was living in Duxbury at the time, on my own, mm -hmm. and was working as a teacher. And I happened to be walking past the Universalist Church at the time, at the time of their services, I was, I was drawn into the sanctuary by the, the beautiful music that filled the air. The preacher was Daniel Parker Livermore. <laughs> it was as if he were talking just to me. How so? Tell me more. When, uh, when I was 18, my 15-year-old my sister died of an illness. My father had been a strict Calvinist. He believed in predestination and that Rachel's eternal fate had been decided long before she was born. I simply could not accept that then. And I'm st I was still searching for peace about my sister's death and when I heard Daniel, uh, uh, Reverend Livermore, <laughs> talking about God's eternal love and his great desire that all souls should be with him. Did uh, you and Mr. Uh, Reverend Livermore, did you talk about this after the service? Oh, yes. yes I, <laughs> I bet you did. I even got <laughs> private lessons in universalism. <laughs> <laughs> we were married not quite five months later. May 6th, 1845. And quite happily so, I guess. Oh, yes. He was the most wonderful husband a woman could have. We were married 55 years. And he was still writing me love letters right up to the very end. <coughs> and so you became a preacher's wife and a homemaker. Well, yes, but I, I never gave up my determination to remain independent. <coughs> I took up writing, and I had enough success with a, a short novel <coughs> that I began submitting articles for a variety of magazines, which were quite successful. In those early days, taking care of my husband and children, I was still able to bring in several hundred dollars a year from my writing. And I always felt that marriage and family were a choice for me, because I knew that I could support myself if I had chosen differently. Well, I would love to ask you more about your family. I know that's a very important part of your story, but I'd like to skip ahead a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'd like to ask you about the war. I know that uh, this was a life-transforming <coughs> time for you, as I'm sure it was for most Americans. 